everyone. Welcome to tonight's equipping and enabling training on understanding honor shame culture. My name is Ali Carr. I've had the privilege of serving at International Commission for four years, and I'm the host for all of IC's e and &E trainings. For those of you who are new around here, IC's mission is equipping and enabling believers of the gospel of Jesus Christ worldwide by partnering with local churches and evangelism to share his gospel with unbelievers and make disciples. We send teams all over the world on short-term trips to partner with churches to go out and share the good news of Jesus. We train participants how to share the gospel in contextual ways using a variety of simple tools, whether it's your hand, a piece of paper, or by telling a story. For 50 years, IC has been partnering with churches around the globe to strategically equip, enable, reach, and disciple people to Jesus. Each and every year, we receive hundreds of thousands of reports of people hearing the gospel and making commitments to follow Jesus in every corner of the earth. And we just hope to keep going for another 50 years to the glory of God. The purpose of these E&E trainings is to equip and enable you to grow in confidence to share the gospel and make disciples with a variety of people using different applicable gospel sharing tools. Everything we do is filtered through the mission of the Great Commission, which is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that Jesus gave to his disciples back then, but still applies to us as his disciples today. So thanks for joining us tonight as we focus on understanding honor shame culture. Now, you may be thinking, I don't know what honor shame culture means or even is. Or you may be thinking, I know exactly what that means, who those types of people are, and I can even tell you that Americans aren't honor shame, they are guilt innocence culture. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself or our wonderful presenter, but allow me to provide just a simple overview of why understanding and contextualizing the gospel to an honor shame culture is so important to effectively share the good news of Jesus. First, for some context, there are three global culture types. One is fear power, another is guilt innocence, and the last is honor shame. For example, Americans and Europeans are predominantly a guilt innocence culture. African and tribal peoples are fear power and honor shame cultures are predominantly Middle Easterners and Asians. Honor shame culture associates a strong group orientation. Honor is a person's self-worth and value in the eyes of the community. The honor comes from the relationships and results in harmonious relationships. Shame, on the other hand, is a negative public rating where the community thinks lowly of you and you're disconnected from the group. Because honor shame are inherently relational, this type of culture is found in community-oriented societies such as the Middle East and Asia. Those living in honor shame cultures are less independent and more dependent on their family or community for decision-making in such things like their career, where to study, religion, and even who to marry. Thusly, any poor action made on an individual's part will result in shame being brought upon themselves and their family, shunning from the community, and a poor reputation now reflects on the family. But we know that Jesus died to take away all our shame from our sinful mistakes and to crown us with glory and honor. That's the angle we want to come from when sharing the gospel with people in an honor-shame culture. Tonight, we have Crystal Rajan joining us. Crystal brings a very unique and necessary perspective to this topic of understanding honor shame culture because she was raised in the East in a Christian family in an honor shame culture, yet moved to America, which is a guilt innocence culture, while still living and being raised by her Eastern family. Crystal currently lives in Oklahoma City, where she works as a dentist at the Veterans Hospital. After moving to Oklahoma, she joined a small house church that included faithful disciples who trained her in how to share the gospel using simple reproducible tools in order for her to share Jesus with those around her. It was during this time that the Lord really began working on her heart and opening her eyes to the lost people in her community. She currently ministers to Afghan refugees in Oklahoma City and hopes to move overseas in the future to help reach the 3 billion people who have no access to the gospel. 
So Crystal, welcome. To start us off, can you just tell us a little bit more about your upbringing and your Christian family from an Eastern honor shame culture and maybe how that differs from how many people in America are raised? Yeah, so I was born in Dubai, which for, for those that don't know where that is, it is a small country in United Arab Emirates, which is in the Middle East. Um, but though I grew up in a Middle Eastern country, I was very much immersed in my own culture. I went to an Indian school. <laughs> the church that I was in was an Indian denomination. So my church family was all Indian. And uh, the majority of my neighbors <laughs> and friends, um, even in Dubai, were all Indian. So though I was you know, in a country that has a lot of different cultures represented, I was pretty sheltered and grounded in my culture. So you can imagine the culture shock <laughs> that I experienced moving to the States at the age of 12. Um, it was a completely different worldview. And initially I had a really hard time understanding and relating to people from a different culture, um, especially when it came to relationships. Like for example, a parent-child relationship is a um, patronage relationship, which means that, the, you know, the parent provides money, support, access, and protection. Um, but in return, the, the child is loyal. They have an allegiance to the parents. They're very thankful. So growing up, I did everything to please my parents and to make them proud. Um, and that relationship does not end at the age of 18. It kind of just carries on lifelong. Um, another big one was like student teacher, like students and teachers in a student teacher relationship in Dubai or in the honor shame culture is very much, there's a lot of respect. Just your teachers are not your friends. In Dubai, when like a teacher would walk into the classroom, we would all stand up in order to show respect for them. So it was really weird to me, crazy to me when I came here and like, you know, students were like friends with their teachers or disrespectful in classroom, like kids will be like putting makeup on or <laughs> playing games. And that was just so bizarre to me. So I felt like an anomaly. And initially I tried to make friends with primarily Indians because even though they were born and raised here, at least they could understand um, where I was coming from or like the things that, uh, or how I was wired to operate. Um, but as my friend circles grew and, um, and now a lot of the times I am the only Indian in a lot of my friend circles, um, I kind of got an understanding of what the guilt innocence culture was and kind of helped me understand that initially the lens in which I viewed the Western world was very negative. To me, it was unloving for a child to leave the home at the age of 18. Um, it was disrespectful to have an opinion or give an opinion to an older person in the community. And even things that are smaller, like it was shameful to me when people would give a guest uh, water in a plastic cup versus a glass cup, you know, um, or when they would not have like this extravagant meal or their homes were messy when they invited people over just even little things to me that was like, wow, that's, that's not the best way to do it. Um, and even it transcended even into spiritual aspects. To me, it was shameful to share your sin struggles or the struggles of your families, that those things remained under closed doors because your main purpose is to uplift the reputation of who your family is. So, so yeah, so from these pictures, you can say, you can see that, you know, like I was still very much, even in America, very much immersed in my Indian culture, you know, wore the clothes, like loved Indian movies, Indian dancing, but then I also had a lot of, uh, friends from the Western culture. The church that I go to um, is filled with people from the Western culture right now. Um, 
So as I grew up, I realized that there is a lot of beauty in the honor shame culture. We truly do think of others higher than ourselves. We love to serve others and um, to show um, a hospi a, like hospitality is kind of ingrained in who we are. So those are just beautiful things. But the caveat to all that is that you are also at the disposal of what others think about you and not at the disposal of God. Uh, what somebody else thinks about you and about your image matters so much more than what God thinks about you. And um, bearing your own image, maintaining your own reputation matters more than bearing his image. And people would not necessarily say that uh, in an honor shame culture it's it's masked under oh what society thinks is what god thinks you know like this is how god loves as well um so as you can tell culture affects everything it affects the way you perceive the world um it affects the way how you interact with others and most importantly affects the way how you perceive god and you live for him so as you think about ministering to people from the honor shame culture, it is really important to think about ways in which how you can receive their honor um, or in ways of how you can prevent causing shame to them just in a relational sense. Um, but beyond that, also be thinking about how can I present the Bible and present God in a way that makes more sense to them. So I love this diagram. It like shows, you know, the Eastern cultures and the Western cultures. So it's not that the Eastern cultures negate guilt, innocence, or fear power. We just operate primarily through honor, shame. Similarly, it's not that the Western culture negates honor, shame, or fear power. We just operate primarily through um, guilt, innocence, and the way we operate often is the way in which we um, receive from God and talk to God and have a relationship with him as well. So, um, so the next slide has kind of uh, the main differences between honor, shame, and guilt, innocence. I'm mainly going to focus on these two cultures because those are the two worldviews that often collide for me. Um, and those are the worldviews that I am just with the most. So for an honor shame culture, the cultural context is very communal. It is very family based. Um, it is your family, your church family, your friends, and not just your media family, your extended family, their extended family, um, if you might be wondering why Indians have the biggest weddings, it's because uh, if you invite one person, you have to invite their entire extended family or that's shaming to them, you know? So it's a very communal, very society-based, whereas a guilt innocence culture is very individualistic. Like you are your own person. You can make your own choices. Um, you can follow the things that you think is right. Um, so the definition of normal in honor shame culture is expectations and ideals versus rules and laws. So here it's like there are certain rules that we follow when we go to church. There are certain rules that we follow when we visit a family. Um, but in honor shame culture, there are certain expectations. There are expectations on how you should carry yourself when you go to church. There are expectations on how you should receive a guest, be a guest. Um, now I'm just going to like use those two examples, um, but it's not necessarily like laws and rules. It's an expectation. Everybody knows the expectation. Everybody's expected to follow them. So the guide for your behavior is not your own conscience. It is what the community has um based for for you what is what does a public community say about this and when you don't follow what the community um what the expectation is or when you don't follow what the community wants you to do the result of that violation in honor shame culture is shame 
And again, because it's a communal culture, it is not just shame that you bring upon yourself. It is shame that you bring to your family, your extended family, your community. It, it kind of transcends down because we're so communal. And so the core problem becomes that you are the mistake. Like I am a mistake, and that's why I have brought shame to my family. It is not, I thought about this individually, I made a mistake, and I was wrong. It is, I am a mistake, and because of my mistake, not only, not only am I affected, many people are affected. So you can like almost know the weight that that carries to a person. Um, so yeah, so the affected party is the group in large. And when that weight is, um, is at stake, the violator's response is often to hide or flee or cover. Um, an extreme of this is what is called like honor killings. If you guys know what that is, if a, if a child, you know, brings shame to the family, the, it is okay for the parents to kill that child in order to res restore their own honor because you are banishing that object of shame. Crystal, could you give an example of of what a like an act that a child could do to bring shame on the family? Just like a very practical example for our watchers. Yeah. Something small can just be if like education is very important to um, to people from the honor shame culture. So if a child is not as studious, um, doesn't make the best grades, that can reflect poorly on the parents and on their parenting. Something mm -hmm. like a little bit heavier is if the child um, disagrees with their parents' um, religion. Like the way that you are brought up, this is a religion that your entire family has followed for years. And if you decide to turn away from that, that is like really shameful to the family. And the, the shame that that family bears is, uh, is so great that oftentimes a, a thing that I hear from a lot of people from the honor shame culture is, I know that Jesus is the way. Like I know that that is the truth, but because of the shame that it will bring my family, I would rather not do it. Like I would mm -hmm. rather die than bring shame to my family. So it is a really big deal, and it is something that's just really ingrained in ourselves growing up. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So the resolution, the resolution in honor shame culture is restoration, whereas in the guilt innocence culture, it is forgiveness. Like you're forgiven. Whether that relationship is restored or not doesn't matter. But in honor shame whether you're forgiven or not, if you're restored, if you're part of the family again, um, then that rebuilds that honor. And a lot of the times it is, um, it's almost like, oh, in order to restore that relationship, you need to undo what you have done. For example, if, if a person, you know, makes bad grades and <laughs> that brings a lot of shame to that family, the way to restore that is to not just make an A, is to like be the valedictorian. You know, like it, you like go to the extreme to restore that honor. Um, or when it comes to religion, it is to leave the religion that you decided to follow to go back to your old religion. So um, yeah, so the honor shame. So the next slide kind of talks about what that looks like in. Um, when it comes to salvation, when, when it comes to how we perceive who God is. So in a guilt-based culture, um, the story of the gospel is that we have all broken God's perfect law. And because we are guilty of that, we deserve a just punishment. And that punishment is death. But then here comes Jesus who stands in our place, he takes that punishment, he takes that death, so that now we are forgiven, and we are made uh, one with God, we have a relationship with him. Whereas in the shame-based culture, um, 
it is not that we don't believe that we have broken God's law. The main thing is that we have broken a relationship with God because of our sin. Like our sin makes us um, filthy and unpure that we cannot go before this holy God. So because people have broken this relationship with a good God, and we have brought shame upon ourselves um, and shame to the image of God. So he had to banish us from his presence. But then he sends Jesus, who lives um, as a perfect son to a father, and he takes our shame. He takes the shame upon himself, repairing that relationship by repairing the honor. And so the response for a shame-based culture is an allegiance to God because he restores our honor versus a confession like god i'm sorry please forgive me like though we say that uh, it is more of an allegiance like thank you god for restoring my shame and giving me honor giving me a place in your family so i really like how this chart um, words the result so for a guilt base it says god god pardons wrongdoings and declares um, lawbreakers to be innocent. That is the core of our gospel. Whereas for a shame-based culture, it is God makes outcasts his children and exalts people to eternal glory. So again, it's a very communal thing. Like you are banished from his family, but now you're part of his family. Um, and that is what really connects or resonates with someone from a shame, um, from an honor shame culture. Um, so this really, the two worldviews really collided for me when I decided to get baptized. Um, and this was a time when I brought a lot of shame to my family. And I know you might be hearing this and being like, that's not even a bad thing. Uh, but that's the point. It's my entire family is, was baptized, uh, believes in child baptism. Uh, my grandparents, everyone in my church, my extended family, like I don't know one person that is related to me or in uh, my like, parents' community that will say adult baptism is good. So when I decided to get adult baptized, I knew that my parents would not take it well because I am also telling them that, you know, I don't want to continue in the same denomination that they are a part of. But it was really, it really hit me when my parents would say things like, you are leaving our faith by doing that. Which um, to me, I was like, no, we're still the same faith. But because um, the decision that I'm making is so contrary to how they raised me, to the values that they instill upon me. And like I mentioned earlier, for a child to a parent, it's um, not transactional, but very like, I have raised you this way and you are you should obey me and like have an allegiance towards me, have a respect towards what, what I have taught you. And that is true. Um, and they really felt like I was saying that they're up, the way they raised me, the way they taught things to me were wrong when it wasn't. Like I was like, this is my conviction. I see this in scripture and I wanted to do that. But to them, it felt very much as an attack to their upbringing. And mm -hmm. underlying all that, it is also shameful to the community. I remember before I decided to get baptized, a lot of other parents were really excited for me to mentor their children and um, like be a figure for their kids to look up to. But when I decided to leave that church and get baptized, um, the, a lot of parents were like, oh, she's a bad influence, you know? And again, it's not something that I'm doing bad, but because I'm going against the grain of what their expectation and norm is from the culture, I was bringing shame to my family. What I wanted also to emphasize was that during this time, 
the words that the Holy Spirit was telling me was, um, who am I to you? Like God was asking me, who am I to you? And where does your allegiance lie? Like, am I the Lord of your life? Or is your community, your parents, the Lord of your life? And that was a really big struggle for me. And a um, question that I had to answer and come to terms with. And the verses that I memorized during that season were a lot of verses of how God takes away our shame and restores our honor. The verses about, I am a child of God. I don't need to fear anything, but he is my father. And it is his image and his reputation that uh, matters to me. So though I was following in the footsteps of, this is my decision. This is my conviction. I see this in scripture and I want to follow this. So those are a lot of like Western worldviews, Western thinking, um, the way that the Lord was ministering to me like the underlying root issue of why that was such a struggle for me is because I knew the shame that I was bringing my family and it would be a lot easier to not be obedient to God in this. So when we share the gospel um, uh, with honor shame culture, I'm just going to use this simple tool that we all, uh, I think most people know this tool, it is the three circles. Um, but when I share it with people from honor shame culture, I share it very differently than for people from uh, the guilt innocence culture. So I'm just going to share it and we can talk about it. The first circle represents the world that God created. It was beautiful and it was perfect. And God created man and he loved them. And he promised to lead them in his way and he would bless them. And in return, man obeyed God. He obeyed this perfect God. He honored, gave honor to his name. And uh, man was made in the image of God, which means that man represented God's character. But when we decided to sin and we decided to walk away from God, we became banished from his presence because he is a holy God, and a holy God cannot part cannot be around um, sinners, cannot be okay with sinners. And because we brought shame to his holy name, he had to banish us from his presence. And so the world that we live in now, which is the second circle, is a broken world. Um, and we carry that shame in us. But nobody likes to live in shame. So we want to escape from the shame. And so we think, okay, if I can just maintain a good reputation, if I can make sure that everybody else thinks about me or what everybody else thinks about me is good, um, then I can restore my own honor. Um, or we think, if I just study really hard and get a really good education, then I can restore my honor. Or we think, if I just get married to a really good guy, raise a very godly family, I can restore my honor. But all these ways that we try to take shame away and restore our honor is like a rubber band. Eventually, they snap us back into this broken world. But God wants us to be part of his family. He... Um, doesn't want to be separated from us. So he sent Jesus. And Jesus was a perfect example of what a son should be to a father. He obeyed God perfectly. He honored God in the way that he spoke, in the things that he did, um, and how he interacted with people. And he was the perfect representation of who God was. So in order to make a way for sinners to be with God, and Jesus went through a shameful and separating death so that we can be forgiven and brought back into God's family. He made a way for our honor to be restored so that we can be back into God's family. So some of the key things um, 
when you talk to a honor shame culture is to bring up those words honor and shame talk about how when god created the world he promised to lead the people he loved them perfectly he promised to bless them abundantly and man was called to obey this perfect god to honor his name by what we did and to represent his image um so like talk about those key aspects kind of like that parent child relationship and then talk about how when we disobey god when we decide to do things our own way and not god's perfect way that is called sin and that separates us from god we bring shame to his name and shame cannot be in his presence so he has to banish us and then when you go into the second circle it's really good to talk about the things that people in this culture really hold on to uh, to restore their honor one is reputation um and so talk about how you know we try to maintain this good reputation you can elaborate more into that of how like well we all still sin and we the the you know the the wages of sin is still death and like i said they focus a lot on education and money so talking about that as a vice of like restoring our honor or our marriage and family again community is a big thing um so those three things are kind of what i hit on as like the rubber bands the squiggly lines that we try to how we try to get back to god and how all those ways are few are futile and then when we talk about jesus we're still talking about how like you know he was that perfect son and he did obey god he did honor god he did represent him well and he he took that shame and that separation on that cross to restore us back to god so um just a verbal proclamation that eternal honor comes from Jesus. I think that is the main thing. It's like all these other things can restore your honor temporarily, but Jesus' death restores your honor permanently, and it is an honor with a holy God. Um so next slide kind of talks about another way um another way that we can share the gospel with people from this culture. It's also through storing from the Bible. But storing from the Bible from a perspective of honor shame is very different from a perspective of guilt innocence. And just to demonstrate, I talk this is a story of the prodigal son. And so from a guilt innocence culture, the story is more in the lines of wow, this the son um did wrong. He took his father's money, he squandered it, and he he almost got the just reward for his sin and that's why he ended up working with pigs and um but then when he comes back to his father his father welcomes him with open arms but when you look at it from an honor shame culture especially when you're sharing this story to an honor shame culture talking about how when uh, the son actually brings a lot of shame to that family when he decides to take his father's money and run away like like i mentioned uh the allegiance a son has to a father is lifelong you don't just leave <laughs> you um you are in that family so when he's leaving he's actually bringing a lot of shame like all the people would have been like wow your son left like with with your money that's so wrong you know and um the son brings shame but when he squanders the money on worthless things he didn't use the money to get an education he used it on worthless things and how that also brought shame to the father and to his household and then he causes even more shame when he goes and gets the worst job um to live to work among pigs to eat what pigs eat like everyone in that society would have probably laughed at this father and laughed at this family and shunned this family because of the level of shame that this son has brought the family uh, to uh, to his father so the natural response 
from an honor shame culture is to banish the son in order to restore that honor to that family what that father should have done is to cast him away is to say i don't have a son like that but what we see the father doing is that he waits for his son and he restores his honor within the family first right he gives him a robe he gives him a ring he welcomes him back into the immediate family but then he throws a banquet and he proclaims it to the rest of the family so not only is the son's honor restored in the immediate family it's restored communally and he is welcomed back into the community um, and just tying that into how that is what god does for us we have restored our relationship with god but we also are part of the big family of god and um, and what that looks like to be in the family of god so yeah just so just to close off some of the key things to just think about um one is to ask questions and to find out what are ways that is honoring to this person versus dishonoring the things that we might consider in a guilt innocence culture as no big deal might actually bring a lot of honor to this family or might bring a lot of shame to this family so learning those little things as you're building relationships and then when you're sharing the gospel really sharing it from a communal perspective um, and really talking about being a part of God's family versus away from God's family and what Jesus does to restore our honor permanently. That is so good, Crystal. Thank you. I I love your perspective with the honor shame culture with the prodigal son story. It's so different from our uh, Western mentality. When we hear that story, we we pick out other details, but to hear it from um, the honor shame culture really makes a huge difference because there's so many people that live in this culture. That's billions of people that all think this way. And it's so different from our American mentality. So thank you for sharing that perspective. And of course, your own story, again, very interesting because you were raised in a Christian home. So even though your whole family believed in God, they were followers of Jesus because you decided to follow Jesus and it looked different than your family it, it was a real problem for your family. It, it, it was bringing shame on your family. So I feel like that's also something in America that we take for granted as Christians because we can be raised in a Presbyterian church if we decide to go to a Baptist church later, like, okay, well, if that's their decision, because we are very individualistic. 18 years old, you move out of mom and dad's house or mom and dad are trying to get you to move out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, obviously in the East, family is so important. You can live with your family forever and your parents live with you even when you're an adult and married. So thank you just for everything you shared. It's so invaluable. You know, we send teams all around the world on mission trips to to Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and all these cultures really differ. So it's so important to learn how to contextualize the gospel and stories from the Bible so that those who we are sharing the good news with can relate. It's relatable to them and they understand it more clearly. So thank you for everything that you shared. Thank you for having me. It's, it was an honor. <laughs> if you all want to learn more about International Commission, you can visit us on our website. If you don't already subscribe to our YouTube channel where you're watching this right now, just hit that subscribe button right below this video. As I mentioned, we send teams all around the world. So if you're interested in going on a short-term trip with us this year or next year, head to our website or our Facebook or Instagram page. You can see all of our trips listed there. Our next training will be in two weeks from today on March 9th, and that is how to share the gospel with Native Americans. So if you liked this training and you want to learn more of how to contextualize the gospel with Native Americans, we even have trainings in the past with, with Muslims and Hindus and Mormons. We have all of that located on our website under resources. So we would love for you to join us in two weeks for our next training. So Crystal, thank you again so much for joining us. And would you mind closing us out in prayer before we leave? Yeah, for sure. Father, we thank you, God, that you and your word transcends all worldviews and all cultures. Um, and we thank you, God, that the guilt, innocence, honor, shame, the fear of power, Lord, that 
they can each take such unique nuggets from your word, Jesus. And so we pray, God, for those that are just watching this training today. We pray, Jesus, that you would um, equip them and train them and teach them, O oh Lord, on how to take your gospel to these differing cultures, O oh Lord. We pray, God, for a spirit of patience and willingness, Lord, to learn the differences and to bridge the gaps, O oh God, in order, Father, for your word to get to those places where it hasn't reached yet, Father. And we pray, O oh Lord, for the National Commission and for what you are doing through them, Jesus. We pray that you would just bless their word, God. We pray, O oh Lord, that through their ministry, that many would come to know you, God, and that many would claim allegiance to you and make you king of their lives. Father, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you for um, an opportunity and a privilege, O oh Lord, just talk about you um, and who you are and what you have done in our lives. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Crystal. Such a great training. And we hope to see you all back here in two weeks for the next one.